Good morning, friends, and welcome to another Physically Distant Service. It is our graduation Sunday, and we are recognizing nine graduates this morning, honoring them and appreciating all of their work as they continue to advance their education and enter careers. So we're really excited to be uh, honoring them today with you. We will have Zoom fellowship at 11 o'clock. We've been doing this now for over a year, and it's been a really great time of sharing. So at 11, there is a Zoom link that would have been sent to you. We welcome you to join us. May 30th, we are going to be out in the woods for our service. That's our Memorial Day service. And we invite everyone to bring a chair, and we will start service at 1015, and we'll be singing and We'll have special music in singing and, and a message and a children's message. So we're really excited to be together again out in the woods. If the weather is really bad, we're going to cancel that. And there still will be a virtual service on Sunday at 1015. So we would encourage everyone to watch that if we cannot make it out there because of the weather. And we will make contact with you if that's the case. June 6th, it's finally going to happen. The meeting has approved being back in the building for service, and that will be June 6th. And so we will be asking folks to wear a mask. There will be children's programming for our kids. If it's, the weather is okay, it'll be outside. But uh, we are just so excited at the thought that we're going to be back together uh, in person for worship service. We will continue to have a virtual service every Sunday at 1015. So those that cannot attend face-to-face -face or live outside of our city, uh, we're going to welcome you that way also on an ongoing basis. And just to put this on your calendar, we are going to have Vacation Bible School. It's going to be here at the meeting, and it's July 18th through the 22nd. So please put that on your calendar with, for your kids or your grandkids or neighbors. Um, we're really looking forward to being back together to do Vacation Bible School. Will you join me in a prayer for graduating students? Gracious God, surround those who are graduating with your grace. Bless them with hope so that they move into the future with eager and open hearts. Help them to put the knowledge, skills, and insight gained through their education to use for the good of all humankind. Inspire them to believe in the goodness of life, even when faced with challenges and difficulties. And as they move into this new chapter, may they grow ever more grateful, compassionate, and wise. Amen.
Friends, we are thrilled to be celebrating our graduates. I wish we could be in person having this celebration, but I did deliver a gift to each graduate over the last week and wanted to see them and take their pictures, so we've got some of those pictures for you to see of our graduates. Uh, but we're just, we're just thrilled for their accomplishment through this most difficult time. It's probably been much harder in going to high school and college and a master's level program, so we uh, just honor and appreciate all of our students. There are four high school graduates. Sam R. Lee graduates from Speedway High School as salutatorian of the class of 2021. He will attend Purdue University and plans to major in engineering. A favorite memory of first friends was the youth trip to Philadelphia in 2015. From my remembrance of Sam, he was part of our first affirmation class. He completed the class and traveled with us to Philadelphia. He was part of the three amigos that played cards in the van, played catchphrase phrase in the library of Pendle Hill, hung out together, visited a number of Quaker historical sites, roller skated along the river outside downtown Philadelphia, and spent time in the art center at Pendle Hill that didn't end up that well. You'll have to ask Sam about that. Sam is an exceptional young man, and we are so excited for his future. Lena Brooks Kelly will be graduating from the International School of Indiana this May and will be attending UCLA in the fall. She plans on majoring in philosophy or psychology. She hopes to go to law school or pursue a graduate degree. She came to First Friends when she moved to Indianapolis in 2014 and have felt nothing but welcomed into the community. Her favorite memory was working on the community garden with Nancy Scott and Sam Ryan and others. She appreciates how no matter the age or background, First Friends is a big family. I remember Lena's family when they moved to Indianapolis a few years ago, and Lena's mom, Ruth, and Lena, who had attended Bloomington Friends for a number of years, started attending First Friends. I remember being part of the Pride Parade with Lena a couple years ago, and I knew that she was a young person that stood in her truth and embraced our testimony of equality. She is quiet but fierce. Lena is smart, as evidence that she will be attending UCLA in the fall. She's also principled, and I'm excited to see where her journey takes her. Lena also helped with our garden, and the gardeners loved what she did with our common garden out there. Christian Kaufman will be graduating from North Central High School uh, soon and is headed to Indiana University Bloomington this fall. He intends to enroll in the Leadership and Management Program, LAMP, but before college begins, Christian and his dad are heading to Alaska for a two-week backcountry backpacking trip. There is a picture of Christian that is from his COVID-delayed Eagle Scout Court of Honor Sunday on May 16th, 2021. His Eagle Scout project of creating and installing both an interpretive sign and individual arboretum signs for all the major trees in the First Friends Meditational Woods during the pandemic one year ago was fondly remembered. Christian's project was instrumental in his training for leadership and service, but it was also a testament to the teamwork with the members of First Friends who generously gave of their time and knowledge in assisting him. Christian felt especially honored by the chance to give back to the meeting that means so much to him. He has internalized the Quaker testimonies, our spices, particularly peace, as he has declared himself a conscientious objector this year. I've known Christian since he was in grade school when his dad, Larry, started attending First Friends. Christian is smart, reflective, and interested in all religions. He attended our first youth affirmation class and completed all the requirements, but then had a health issue the morning we were to leave for Philadelphia. Christian missed that trip, but went with us in 2019. He had great questions and insights as we toured all of Philadelphia's sites. Christian's Eagle Scout project last year was marking all of those trees in the meditational woods, and we now have a very professional-looking sign with all of the postings of the types of trees. 
what a gift to the meeting, as our Meditational Woods is a significant green space. Christian worked with our Meditational Woods group and showed his leadership capabilities. Christian went to many youth activities over the years, and I loved engaging with him and his thoughts. Isaiah Sample is graduating from Short Ridge High School as well. He will be attending Ivy Tech in the fall with plans on majoring in human services. Isaiah has been part of youth group through junior and senior high. He always brought his entire self to youth group, and we all appreciated his perspective. Isaiah was usually caffeinated and ready to engage. He has lived the testimonies and wants to engage and further his views with others. Isaiah will be a vocal advocate for peace and justice. We have several college graduates that we're honoring today. Eleanor Ellie R. Lee graduates from Indiana University Bloomington with a Bachelor of Science in Education with majors in elementary education and special education. She's currently interviewing with school districts in the Indianapolis area and hopes to secure a teaching position for the upcoming school year. One special memory of First Friends was her part on the committee to help establish the youth affirmation class and participating in the class itself. I remember Ellie being very instrumental in this creation of our Affirmation Youth Program. When we found out that the Center for Congregations was offering significant financial support for new programming for youth, we put together a team of individuals to brainstorm and guide us through the application process and the development of the curriculum and programming. We knew it would be important to have a young person on the team, and Ellie volunteered and stepped up to be a part of the group. Her insight and input was invaluable to us as we were awarded the grant and developed the curriculum and program. I know Ellie will be a great teacher, and we so need great teachers with ideas and energy to guide and inform our children. I am excited to watch Ellie's future unfold. Eli Sample is graduating with his associate's degree in informatics from Ivy Tech and he will be transferring to IUPUI in the fall. Eli has participated in youth group over a number of years. He's been a part of many of our youth activities, and while he is quiet, he's very thoughtful. I remember praying with him in the hospital before a significant surgery and thinking at the time how brave he was as he faced this medical situation. Eli has been smart and committed as he studied at Ivy Tech and now heading to IUPUI. I look forward with great anticipation the impact he will have on our world. And now for those receiving advanced degrees. Kristen Koning. Kristen completed her master's in applied statistics with a concentration in biostatistics from Penn State this May. After a number of years working at WebMD, she has spent the past year and a half leading a clinical analytics team for Ascension St. Vincent. She transitioned to a new role leading product analytics with Ascension's National Strategy and Innovation Organization last month. And since she has been working full time while studying, she doesn't have any immediate career changes in mind. Long term, Kristen plans to continue leading technical teams with the hope of improving patient care and transforming healthcare through data, technology, and research. Almost exactly five years ago, Andy, now her husband, and Kristen attended First Friends together for the first time. It was on their second date just before an afternoon of hiking at Holiday Park. At that point, Kristen had no idea that her relationship with First Friends and with Andy would grow in depth and breadth the way they have. So she has particularly fond memories of her first Sunday visiting back in 2016. Kristen says that the diversity of people, the perspectives, and life experience combined with the genuine intention to listen deeply and learn from one another became one of her favorite aspects of this spiritual community. Since I had the honor of officiating Kristen and Andy's wedding and hearing firsthand the story she just told during premarital counseling, I have been so happy to see Kristen's continued involvement and desire to seek a better understanding of the Quaker way. Most recently, Kristen's expertise and keen insight have been a lifeline for the reopening task force. Congratulations, Kristen. Sean Haymaker. 
Sean graduated from IUPUI Heron School of Art and Design with a master's in art therapy. He recently accepted a job offer in Lebanon, Indiana at Integrated Wellness. Sean has always enjoyed the conversations and connections with all of his friends at First Friends. Sean looks forward to times when we can all gather in person again. He says, love to all. I cannot agree more, Sean. Whether it was scooping ice cream with you at the dairy bar, discussing art and your well thought out and poignant questions, or most recently when we discussed in fellowship hour how to be the change we want to see in the world regarding the Newfield's racial issues. In each of these, our, your gentle and caring heart for all people was evident. The people who come to you for art therapy will be blessed by someone who truly cares. Congratulations, Sean. Beth Henricks. Beth is graduating from the Earlham School of Religion with a Master's in Divinity. She began this educational journey about nine years ago when she began to serve in paid ministry at First Friends. It has been a long and meaningful journey of study, spiritual deepening, expanding her understanding of God, and being part of a faith community that extends beyond her city. Beth has been a part of the First Friends community for 28 years. She became a Quaker because of First Friends and became involved in a number of activities over the years. First Friends has been such an important community through the peaks and valleys of life's circumstances, and she treasures the many relationships she has with so many. Becoming a pastor has been an amazing path of discovery, and it has been her honor and privilege to serve First Friends in this way after a 23-year career in business. First Friends is her home, and she has always felt welcome, embraced, and appreciated. I've only known Beth for a little over four years, but in that short time, I not only consider her a dear friend, but she is also the best ministry partner I have ever had the opportunity to work with. Her dedication to the people and ministry of First Friends and her deep desire to seek the answers to life make for a robust and contagious soul. In the long nine years that Beth pursued this degree, her determination and passion for life and the Quaker way both were tested, cultivated, and enlightened. But her endurance has been rewarded, and now we at First Friends get the opportunity to be blessed by her wisdom. A while back, Beth asked for a clearness committee regarding whether she would even finish her degree, because it still seemed out of reach. Beth, your graduation shows not only how obtainable it was, but also how faithful you are to this community that surrounds and supports you. May we all look to you as an example of how to rely on each other's wisdom as we seek clarity for life's decisions. Beth, you are a major part of what makes First Friends a beautiful community. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your life with us, and congratulations. Our scripture reading today is Isaiah 65, 23 to 25, the message version. For my people will be as long lived as trees. My chosen ones will have satisfaction in their work. They won't work and have nothing come of it. They won't have children snatched out from under them. For they themselves are plantings blessed by God. With their children and grandchildren, likewise God blessed. Before they call out, I'll answer. Before they finish speaking, I'll have heard. Wolf and lamb will graze the same meadow. Lion and ox eat straw from the same trough. But snakes, they'll get a diet of dirt. Neither animal nor humans will hurt or kill anywhere on my holy mountain, says God. Good morning, friends. Today, as we celebrate our graduates and as they head out into new opportunities, I want to take a moment to speak about the soulfulness of work. 
I believe I've shared this story before, but when I was working at Huntington University, I had the opportunity to go hear Wendell Berry and Wes Jackson speak at Indiana University. They happened to be talking about farming and the importance of being connected to the earth. Even though I was not a farmer, I gleaned so much from this lecture that I continued to return to it ever so often. Well, during the question and answer section, a student who I believe was just trying to get some answers for a paper asked a not so well thought out question about work. It came almost immediately after Wes Jackson said the following about growing up. He said, people who impressed me were those who worked. Now to answer the student's question, Wendell and Wes both rose to their feet and began addressing the way our culture looks at work. Things like, people today think work is boring, work is trivial, work is what we have to do so we can have fun, or what Wendell summed up with the American phrase, less work equals more life, which is exactly what the student had assumed. Wes then said, work doesn't have to be fun, but rather satisfying. Wendell added, satisfaction means you've done something. It's part of your being or life. Well, I found myself writing as fast as I could while thinking about how different things this was than what our world says, or even more, what the church told me growing up. I realized that many people I knew hated work. Now, many were simply lazy or living for the weekend, yet some took on two or three jobs to pay outstanding credit card bills, while others did the same simply to purchase bigger toys or go on grander trips or live in a more lucrative neighborhood. And then there was those who worked simply to survive. I think we must remember each person has a completely different story when it comes to work. For the past 25 plus years as a pastor, I can't count the number of people who have met with me struggling with their work, some who've considered their work lives miserable or a dreaded task to complete. And the big theme I continue to see is that they are simply not satisfied by what they do. My friend John Pattison writes in the book, Slow Church, soulless work is one of the alienating effects of industrialization. Along with unemployment and underemployment and low wages and child labor, the imposition of degraded work on degraded people and a ream of other consequences. But we can have a very different view of work, one that seeks a balance between taking, taking work too seriously and not taking it seriously enough. Doing good work is one important way we respond as followers of Jesus to the work God is already doing around us. Let's be honest. Most of us were not taught to value all types of work. I remember people telling me when I was young, well, you don't want to grow up to be a garbage man or work at a gas station, do you? Well, that view changed when the guy who pumped my gas each week in Silverton, and please understand, when we lived in Oregon, you could, not, you could not pump your own gas. But this guy became a regular attender to meeting for worship. I began to value his work and who he was because I was able to get to know more of his story. We would never say, you don't want to grow up to be a doctor or lawyer. But I know doctors and lawyers who are miserable in their professions and are not satisfied. And the same is true about people who are retired because their work was so much a part of them that stopping work was an attack on their being. Now, let's be honest. We still categorize work by what we would be willing or unwilling to do, and that's creating negative perceptions of work. For some people, their work is not an option. They work for survival. They work at whatever job they can get. They are often grateful to simply have a job, but too often those type of jobs are ones that sadly exploit workers. Jobs that are not satisfying because they dehumanize people and they become estranged from their own being and the tasks that could engage their human potential and creativity. Instead, they're forced to take jobs that are repetitive, uninteresting, and unsatisfying because the world has alienated them by saying things like, I heard growing up, 
about garbage men and gas sta station attendants. Or too often, we make professional athletes and celebrity status and stardom the goal. For goodness sakes, just think about it. We have a long-standing show in our country called American Idol and about 20 other reality shows that create a process to manufacture stardom. What if we valued blue-collar workers and jobs as much as we valued white-collar workers and jobs? If we taught our children that all work is valuable and needed? Those immigrant farmers were just as important as the farmers. The garbage collectors were just as important as the doctors. The members just as important as the pastors. See, I think you might be getting this. What I'm talking about is the Quaker distinctive of equality, that all people are equal in the eyes of God. No title or position should get in the way of how we treat others. As well, since we often identify so deeply with our vocations, we introduce ourselves by our work. We identify by our work. We even associate by our work. For several years at Huntington University, I taught an upper-level class with a college counselor called Calling, Being, Doing, Rethinking the Rest of Your Life. The class proceeded through looking at one's calling to seeing one's being and then to what one would do with what they learned. Many students found themselves in their junior or senior year fretting over what they were going to do with their lives. Maybe some of our graduates today are still at that place since they graduated during a pandemic. Too often, though, we found, especially at a Christian university, how much the church and its views negatively influenced the students and did not allow them to see and embrace their being and who they genuinely were, leaving them fearful and fretting the world outside the so-called college bubble. Well, Quaker Parker Palmer addressed this very thing in Yes! Magazine in an article titled, Now I Become Myself. Just listen to what he had to say. I first learned about vocation growing up in the church. I value much about the religious tradition in which I was raised, its humility about its own convictions, its respect for the world's diversity, its concern for justice. But the idea of vocation I picked up in those circles created distortion until I grew strong enough to discard it. I mean, the idea that vocation or calling comes from a voice external to ourselves, a voice of moral demand that asks us to become someone we are not yet, someone different, someone better, someone just beyond our reach. That concept of vocation is rooted in a deep distrust of selfhood, in the belief that the sinful self will always be selfish unless corrected by external forces of virtue. It is a notion that made me feel inadequate to the task of living my own life, creating guilt about the distance between who I was and who I was supposed to be leaving me exhausted as I labored to close the gap. Today, I understand vocation quite differently, not as a goal to be achieved, but as a gift to be received. Discovering vocation does not mean scrambling towards some prize just beyond my reach, but accepting the treasure of true self I already possess. Vocation does not come from a voice out there calling me to become something I'm not. It comes from a voice in here, calling me to be the person I was born to be, to fulfill the original selfhood given me at birth by God. I will be honest. I wish my pastor in church growing up would have quoted and shared those words of Parker Palmer with me, because it has taken a long time. Actually, I would say I'm still wrestling with it to grasp that vocation comes from my inner voice calling me to be the person I was born to be, to fulfill the original selfhood given to me by the divine. I guess what I'm trying to say is, in all of this, is that clearly we need to have a paradigm shift in the way we look at work. Author and storyteller Dorothy Sayers put it rather succinctly, speaking of a carpenter in the church. She said, how can anyone remain interested in a religion 
which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of his life. The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be a drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. Graduates, members, and attenders, virtual guests, and friends, as we go out into the world, I hope you are encouraged each day to listen to your inner voice, to fulfill your original selfhood, and go and make good tables, or whatever your gifting and the spirit of the divine lead you to make, or do, or create, or think, etc. Go today and embrace becoming your true self. Find satisfaction in doing what is truly you, and you will find the soulfulness of work. Now, for those of us who need to ponder on this and wrestle with this some more, here are some queries to lead us into waiting worship this morning. Am I satisfied by my work? Where do my views of good work need to change? And how can our meeting affect change in the idea of work in our community? Here's a hymn for today.
Let all things now living a song of thanksgiving to God the Creator, triumphant be raised, who fashioned and made us, protected and stayed us, who guideth us on to the end of our days. His Please join us in our benediction today, a graduation blessing. May God's blessing follow you all as you find new journeys to travel. May you walk safely along the pathways of your dreams. May God's gentle hand guide the decisions you will make and the passions that you follow. May your hearts and lives always reflect God's love and truth. And may hope be a light within you that you carry into each new day. Amen. Have a great week and celebrate in your graduations and this wonderful weather. Amen. <laughs>